The liberal wing of the Supreme Court had been anchored, of course, by Ruth Bader Ginsburg for more than a generation. Now, the things that she fought for could be in jeopardy as the court will shift right, that, assuming that President Trump's nominee gets confirmed by the Senate. My next guest just wrote an interesting piece in The Atlantic saying that the great liberal reckoning has begun and the death of Justice Ginsburg concludes an era of faith when it comes to the courts. Alan Rodenstein, he is an associate professor of law at the University of Minnesota. And, you know, Alan, when I read your piece, I thought it was interesting to go through history. Um, and, and, I, and I also thought it telling, I saw Senator Romney saying, you know, the liberals believe um, that a 5-4 court in their favor is written as stars. It's not. It's a little bit of a misread of history. It's not that this has been this hugely progressive court for generations. In fact, they've taken baby steps in many cases here. Um, and certainly for the last 15, 20 years, you know, this 5-4 toss-up has been more often than not. That's right. Um, you know, ever since the, the founding of the country, the Supreme Court has been generally a much more conservative institution than it's been a progressive one. And really, you didn't see the court turn to a progressive direction really until the 1940s and 50s um, after uh, FDR managed to appoint um, a record eight justices to the Supreme Court. Um, that hit its high watermark in the 50s and 60s um, during what's called the Warren Court after the Chief Justice Earl Warren. But then when Nixon uh, began to appoint uh, nominees, that really pushed the Supreme Court to the right. Uh, and since then, it's moved in a steadily more and more conservative direction. Obviously, that's something that liberals and progressives don't like. But in a way, it's back to the um, historical norm for uh, the role that the Supreme Court has played in American life. Alan, before we look ahead, uh, let's take recent rulings and let's put them through the prism of a 6-3 conservative court um, because I think people are mistakenly saying okay what's going to happen in November with the ACA or what's going to happen potentially next year what about things for example gay marriage or uh, cases where we've seen a separation of church and state let alone you know recent decisions affordable care Act. how different would those cases have been considered? And if you want to go back even further um, to how separate but equal was looked at by the court, if there is an arch-right conservative appointee to the court, how different could we look at present-day um, law versus what we just take for granted, including choice? I do think that um, there are some issues that the conservatives care about more than others. So, for example, I would be very surprised if... Um, a 6-3 uh, a conservative court were to try to uh, overturn something like Obergefell, which was a decision um, that constitutionalized the, the right to, to marry for, for gay and lesbians. Um, uh, at the same, you know, similarly, I think that um, although we're going to get a much more Supreme Court, I think that justices like Chief Justice Roberts and Justice Kavanaugh are sufficiently sensitive to the institutional limits of the Supreme Court that to the extent that they want to roll back reproductive rights, they're going to do so carefully. And they might do so simply by continuing to limit Roe versus Wade rather than um, rather than overturn it entirely. Um, on other issues, especially religious liberties or what the conservatives view as religious liberties, I suspect you're going to get a much more aggressive push. Um, and then um, when it comes to issues that are less salient, but I think just as important for everyday Americans, in particular, um, the role of government in being able to regulate uh, economic and social life and also the power of corporations, I think you're going to see a, a, much more, um, a much more conservative uh, turn. In terms of remedies, um, I, and I get a little uncomfortable with this, um, Alan, but uh, as your piece lays out and others as well, uh, it, it was never sacrosanct that it's got to only be nine justices. Um, you go back even to Civil War. I mean, the numbers were somewhat flexible as to how many justices there would be. Um, do you think it would be healthy or are you concerned, given the climate we're in, if Democrats, let's say, won the White House and they took back the Senate and wanted to re-examine um, how many justices should be on the court, what kind of a road we could go down if we pursue that? I think it depends on what the end goal is. If the end goal is to pack the court with justices who are friendly to one side or the other, then yes, I think it's ultimately quite counterproductive because each side will simply expand the court uh, in its own uh, favor. Um, if the goal is rather to remake the court and make it simply a less powerful institution in American life, 
I think that's quite valuable. If the move to increase the size of the court ultimately gets both sides to realize that in the long term, what needs to happen is that the court needs to become less powerful. It needs to hear fewer cases. It needs to have term limits for judges staggered in a way that uh, presidents of different parties can um, expect to appoint a certain number of justices on average. Um, there are lots of different potential remedies. I think that's the way in which the direction needs to go. Um, but I don't think that can happen without some real reforms. And um, I think just looking politically, it may be that um, changing the size of the court is the next, uh, the next step in changing norms around the court. Except um, just today we saw um, that Pennsylvania um, is now going to basically be front and center in terms of when absentee voting needs to be certified. Um, it's going to be pushed back. The Supreme Court will take a look at that. My concern is, and I think it's more, unfortunately, certainly a possibility, if not even a likelihood, if Trump loses, that will have a challenge uh, to the legitimacy of the election. And you could see, like in 2000, that the court be dragged into it again. I'm just so concerned, not that I'm naive that it wasn't already politicized and viewed that way by many. It will be as raw a political tool as the legislative and executive branch, very conceivably, um, if not probably, if we're not careful. I think that's right. There's no easy answer here. There's there's not a lot of comforting uh, words that I can I can provide. I mean, the only thing I can hope is that um, uh, the there are enough institutionally minded conservatives on the Supreme Court. You know, people like Chief Justice Roberts, who I think are able to take a longer view and understand the role that the court plays and and the good it can do and the damage that it can do. Um, that they're aware of that role and and if they have to. Um, weigh in on a contested election, they do so with that kind of wisdom. But I don't know that I could give that same description you gave uh, to the Chief Justice. I, I don't know where um, the others fall, frankly, on the court. Certainly Kavanaugh and, and Gorsuch is maybe giving it a nod that he's really an institutionalist. We don't really know. I don't know really any reason why we should think that Thomas or Alito also wouldn't be afraid um, to take a partisan vantage point on this. So even with something like an election in 40-something days, their role in it, I can't sit here with comfort and say they'll put the institution um, before the politics. And I want to be wrong, but I don't see any reason why I shouldn't be skeptical that they won't. I think you should be skeptical. I wish I, I, wish I could provide some assurance, but um, I, I will say when, when I heard of um, Justice Ginsburg's death, I mean, it's sad for many reasons. She was an incredible figure, an incredible idol to, to so many. Um, but I, I will say, I, I had the feeling in my stomach that I had not felt for four years, um, that I'd last felt when Donald Trump was elected. And I was really worried, again, you know, not about whether conservatives or liberals were going to win, but rather about the stability of our institutions. And I feel that same worry uh, that I did four years ago. And, and I hope it's not going to be a close election. And I tell you, Alan, I've said this before. I've been wrong about many things. I was wrong about how four years ago the election would turn out. But where I've been even more upset as to how wrong I was is th I thought the institutions uh, in this country and the brilliance of our founding fathers and the construction of it wouldn't permit any one person from either political party to cause the havoc and the damage and the question, um, the basic structure of a checks and balances uh, form of government. And now I openly worry um, what the next two months bring for us and even the Supreme Court, regardless of the political makeup, how it will now be considered uh, going forward um, for the indefinite, if not uh, uh, a distant future. So anyway, um, like you, I, I am very concerned here, um, but um, you might have a book on your hands here, depending on how this thing turns out. Alan, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. All right, everybody, when we come back, um, speaking of politics, I'm going to pivot to the presidential race. I'll discuss the vacancy on the high court on, and how that's going to impact who people are going to choose between these two here, how it could help or hurt their chances, and how the public actually feels about it. That and much more after this.